United Nations. And I actually believe that the White House has the same setup. You think I'm kidding. Look this up on the internet and you'll find it to be true. So it all comes into what you were talking about. What is the Vatican? The Vatican as well. The Vatican as well. So, anyway. Um, before you leave tonight, anybody has never gone to one a loud one. <laughs> God bless you all. And um, Shabbat Shalom. We are, the sun has set. And uh, let me get a little set up here real quick. I don't want to lose this beautiful artwork here. So we're going to pull this one around. <laughs> Where, where, where did he run off to? There he is. I'm glad you named all the, the, comed the Jewish comedians that have gone, but gone on now because that means instead of just yourself, we, at least we have more than one opening. That's right. Ah, Baruch Hashem. <laughs> well, I better not put... Ooh, that's nice. I like that. I'll bring this one way out of the way. It's always fun to be last because I get to go a little bit longer <laughs> until they kick us out. <laughs> if you have your Bible uh, with you or if you just want to make notes, whichever way you prefer, i got to wear glasses. By the way, I don't always wear black and white, so although I am still, I haven't been kicked out of the Chabad organization as of yet, uh, they don't watch these videos, so I'm safe. My rabbi is very much a Chabad rabbi. He sent me a Shabbat Shalom message, so I sent him back in Hebrew that I love him very much. He said, thank you. So I hope he doesn't see this video. Uh, <laughs> I'm not going to tell you his name either, so that way you can't call him. 
a good friend of mine, he's also my doctor, Dr. Dade Shah, when I wrote the book Yam Suf, we were going to Passover at the uh, shul, and, which is a synagogue, and when we were having Passover, he runs to the, to the rabbi, and I told him, I said, don't you dare tell him I wrote a book. And the first thing he does, Ravi, did you see Steve's new book? <laughs> I know about the book. We won't talk about the book. <laughs> so I guess he knows a little bit of something that's going on. All right. I guess we won't need this one, really. Uh, I want to take you first to Luke chapter 16. And just to kind of give you a little idea, those of you that uh, are not too much, are not familiar with the ministry that, that, I, that, that God has been so kind to allow me to have, I am Jewish through both my mother and my father. My father, though, however, doesn't know that yet. But, uh, but anyway, no, my father's side, we are, my last name is actually Binun. It's not Dinun, but Binun. Uh, it was changed during the Inquisition. Uh, but when we did do DNA, we found out we were Levites. And, uh, of course, some of the, uh, the, the Levitical side of our family over in Europe and, and Russia, one of the uh, uh, rabbis wrote me and he said that, uh, well, you know, Steve, he said the reason you ended up with the name Binun, he says, because the Holocaust, the Inquisition, all the different things, the pogroms, we've had to change our names, we've had to change religions and everything else we could do in order to survive. And uh, so it's one of the reasons why we came to America as well. My mother's family came here illegally, uh, so I'm glad we have that birth law so I don't get deported. Uh, we, we just started living in Israel part-time, uh, so we came back to take care of some business here, but we'll be going back at the end of September. Uh, we can't do Aliyah because most all the rabbis over there know me, so therefore they're going to make sure that doesn't happen. But I will say one thing. Um, are you aware of Rabbi Tovia Singer? Tovia Singer? No. Rabbi Tovia Singer is probably the most publicly known rabbi in Israel because he debates Christian scholars and he oblit obliterates them. He's very successful in doing that. Uh, he is a very uh, staunch uh, rabbi, uh, Orthodox rabbi, and his passion is to see that the Jewish people stay Jewish. And in part, I can understand why he does that because there's so many different ways in Christianity uh, and it sometimes can be very confusing. But uh, Rabbi Singer, they asked him to debate me recently and of course the people that asked him didn't know that he knows me. So he emailed me and he says, I don't want to debate you. He said, let's talk privately, Steve. He says, because you know, I actually agree with a lot of what you do. And uh, so I thank God for that. And so pray for him. If you want to pray for someone, definitely pray for Rabbi Singer because I'm trusting that he is like Saul and God will get a hold of his life. Um, so anyway, we're going to Luke here. And I go rather rapid once I get going here. Um, in Luke chapter 16. And this is a very famous parable. And the way the Lord has always dealt with me since he really got me to speak publicly is I see things from an Orthodox Jewish point of view. And we're always having new Jewish people that are just coming to know Yeshua to be Moshiach, that's Jesus to be the Messiah. And I do use both ways uh, as far as Jesus and Yeshua. I'm not the critical type. I'm not a Jew for Jesus, although I am for Jesus. I'm not Messianic. I'm a Jewish brother that believes that Yeshua is indeed Mashiach. He is the Messiah. And I thank God that he was kind enough to reveal that to my heart. And, but we have a lot of Jewish people that will even watch this uh, message here tonight that they're just coming to know Yeshua in Israel, especially the ones in Israel. And what they continually say to me is that when we listen to what you're saying, you speak to our heart because... From an Orthodox perspective, we understand what you're talking about when it comes to the Messiah and, and who his identity is. So I see things no different than what you would, but perhaps maybe a little bit because of the background. The parable that I'm going to talk about here, or to, to basically uh, start this off, is the parable about uh, the rich man and Lazarus. And I'm sure everybody here is familiar with that. Uh, and we know that what happens is the rich man, and just so I want to kind of go through it a little quickly here, the rich man has everything really good in life, and Lazarus is only getting the crumbs 
kind of like the dog under the table. You know, the Bible says the master, the, the, the dog eats the crumbs under the master's table. And so when they both die, Lazarus goes to the bosom of Abraham. And the rich man finds himself in hell. And he's wanting desperately that some kind of miracle would happen that would cause his kindred that are still Jews to recognize that this is not a good place to come. And so let's look at verse 25 to start with. It says, But Abraham said, Son, remember that thou in thy lifetime receivest thy good things, and likewise Lazarus evil things. But now he is comforted, and thou art tormented. And beside all this, between us and you, there is a great gulf fixed, so that they which would pass from hence to you cannot, and neither can they pass to us that would come from thence. And by the way, I'm using King James on this. I use a Hebrew Bible as well, but we'll, we don't have this in our Hebrew Bible, so we use the King James. And so he says on in uh, verse 27, Then he said, I pray thee therefore, Father, that thou wouldest send him to my father's house. Now he's talking about sending Lazarus to his father's house. But it gets interesting. For I have five brethren that he may testify unto them, lest they also come into this place of torment. Abraham saith unto him, They have Moses and the prophets. Now, it's very interesting to me because Yeshua is the one that is giving this parable. Now, we realize that God is going to send two witnesses. And I've always thought that was kind of interesting. Why does he send two witnesses? It's not two Baptists. It's not two Pentecostals, it's not two Methodists, <laughs> Presbyterians, and I don't want to go through the list. I think somebody told me last, it's like 34,000 different denominations. But he has to send two witnesses. Another interesting thing, if you think about it, is when Israel as a whole, myself, Sister Leora, and Brother uh, Doctor here, Lipkin, right? Forgive me, I'm sorry, I'm not good on names. I'm from Alabama, you know, we ain't the smartest critters in the world. So. I'm a little bit dyslexic too, so you can just imagine what y'all are going to have to go through. It's going to be like on a roller coaster here. So, anyway though, um, when, when we look at this right here, he says, For I have five brethren that they may testify to him. But any, oh, no, I'm sorry, see that's that dyslexia there. So he sends two witnesses, and then we also have the, the saying in the Bible that when Israel does believe, ten people of the nations or ten Gentiles would take the hold of the seat, seat or the skirt of one Jew. And by the way, Kippah is not biblical. I do this for the sake of my people, not for, for any other reason. Uh, I was in Israel one time, and I was in a laundromat, and when I was doing clothes, I had a rabbi I was in there, and we got into a debate over that. He asked me, because I didn't have the kippah on, you know. He says, why don't you have your kippah on? I said, well, did, did Abraham wear the kippah? He says, no. And he walks back and forth for a little bit, and he thinks. And he says, where is your tzitzit? And I didn't have that on either. A lot of times I keep it tucked in. You know, I don't even keep it out anyway, but I didn't have it on. So, And I said, I uh, left it at the house. Yes, and don't try to tell me that Moses didn't have one of those because God commanded him to have one. So I try never to remember. I always try to remember now to make sure I have it on. But anyway, the Bible says that 10 Gentiles will take the hold of a, of a tzitzit. Now here's what's funny though. You guys have the gospel of Jesus Christ. And all of a sudden we get the gospel and you guys are going to come ask us to show us our ways. Now, it's funny, though, because, see, it's not, some people think, well, it's because of the feast. You guys know the feast. I mean, the Messianic Jews and several other groups and everything, you guys know the feast with no problem. It has nothing to do with the feast. You know what it is? Because we stay in Torah day and night, day and night. And we read through the Tanakh, through the Navim, the Kotavim, the prophets and the writings, that's how the Bible is broke up. That's why we call it Tanakh. It's like an acronym for, for Torah, Navim, Bekotavim, which is the Torah, or the law, the, the prophets and the writings. But we stay in this all the time. And imagine what, what happens when the Holy Spirit pours down like it was on the day of Pentecost 
And Israel begins to recognize who the Mashiach really is, who the Messiah is. And that's what happened to me. And now, every time I open it, I mean, my mind, is, I can't even keep up with the revelation. It's so overwhelming. I can't keep up with it. And so this is what I'm going to share with you tonight. And we're going into redemption, by the way. I know I didn't say that, but that's what we're going into. And then tomorrow night, I'm going to take you through Esther and through Ruth. I was with Sid Roth a little while back, and when I was with him, we, we were talking. Uh, his secretary told me, she said, he'll have about 15 minutes with you. An hour later, I walked out of his office and he asked me, he said, write a book, Steve, on Esther. He said, I've never in my life heard anybody talk about Esther the way you talk about it. So that'll be, I hope that'll be a blessing for you tomorrow. Okay, so anyway, he says right here, Abraham saith unto them, they have Moses and the prophets, let them hear them. And he said, nay, Father Abraham, but if one went unto them from the dead, they will repent. And he said unto him, If they hear not Moses and the prophets, neither will they be persuaded, though one rose from the dead. Yeshua was prophesying of himself. It had nothing to do with Lazarus. He was prophesying of himself. And it was true. Even though he rose from the dead, we still didn't see it. But there's a reason why we didn't see it. We are called to be a priestly nation. Israel was called for that purpose. And we're going to get into that in just a little bit here. First, I want, let's go from there. I want to go right into John chapter 1. This is one of the first scriptures that really got me. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by Him, and without Him was not anything made that was made. Now, when I first read that, well, what am I knocking down? Anyway, when I first read that, that really blew me away because I kept thinking, John's talking about Bereshit. In Hebrew, we say Bereshit. At the first, literally is what it means. At the first or in the beginning. And I'm like, this is interesting. And when I began to read the whole first chapter, I was totally blown away with the revelation. In my opinion, I think he had more revelation than all the other apostles combined about who Mashiach was. And he really began to identify this. So I'm sitting there looking at him like, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God. And the Word was God. And he says, and I'm like, in the beginning was the Word. And that's what stuck in my mind. In the beginning was the Word. So I, I had to grab my, my Tanakh, and I grabbed it, and I flipped over real quick, and I'm like, okay, wait a minute. In the beginning was the Word. In the beginning was the Word. In the beginning was the Word. I'm like, okay, what does God say? Speak. It says, It says, Excuse me. Hayata tohu vevohu vechoshek alpane tachum veruch elahim alchafet alpane chamaim. Okay? Now that's the one you all know. I know. In, in the beginning was, wait a minute, let me read it for you in English here. In the beginning, um, God created the heavens and the earth, and the earth was without form and void, and the darkness was on the face of the deep. And, and a wind from God, I know you have a little, little, little bit different in, in King James, moved over the surface of the waters. It's not the wind, it's the Spirit of God. It's the Ruach is what it was in Hebrew, so it's not the wind. Uh, but here's what really got me, though, because I was looking for the first word. What's the first word God says? Because John's saying it. In the beginning was the word. And then I read it. Ve'yomer Elohim. That means, and God, he said. Ve'yomer Elohim, ya he or. So the first time that God actually speaks in Genesis is right here. And he says, you translate that in your Bible, let there be light. Ya he or. Ya he or is much deeper than let there be. It is just the only way I guess they know how to translate it. Yahi is a present tense. It is God making himself manifest in the dimension you live in so that he can have fellowship with his creation. This is what he is saying. The Yomer Elohim, Yahi Od. Then he says, the Yahi Od. And so we can't say, and it was light. Was his past tense. It's still in the present tense. God is coming into a world so that he can fellowship with us, with his creation. Now, 
As we go from there, though, in a minute, I won't need a note or anything. Now I want to go back to John again. And I want to go to verse 4. Then he says, In him was life, and the life was the light of men. That's what's so interesting. In him was life. And the word for life in Hebrew is chayim. Okay? So, in him was life, and the life was in the life was the light of men. And the light shineth in darkness, and the darkness comprehended it not. Now, what's interesting, though, John is actually giving you a, a, a view of Genesis. But he's letting you know that that light that was in Genesis is Jesus. That's who that light really is. He's telling you that. And he says, and the, and the light was there, but the darkness comprehended it not, which we go into in Hebrew, that there was darkness, the choshech. And the Hoshek was there, but light and darkness can't be together. So God puts Mavdil, which he puts a firmament between. And then, of course, now we get into the part about the sun and the moon and things like that, the darkness, and he calls it day and when he calls night. Laila, Hoshek he calls night. But it's interesting, though, John, instead of looking at this being the sun, when he says, he's not, John notices that this is not dealing with, this light here is not the Shemesh. It's not the sun. It's Yeshua. John clearly tells us that's who it is. But the interesting thing is, and this is why I wanted to bring this out because of the redemption, because he says, in him was life. And the life was the light of men. So when we get into that, the next thing I want to take you to real quick, and then we're going to really go all into the New Testament on these things, is, there we go. Then God, when he begins to create Adam and Eve, the first one he creates is Adam. And he's called Ish. Alap Yod Shin. We're not going to do the, vowel, uh, the vowels in here. Now the rabbis have always debated over why did God call Adam Ish? Why is he called Ish? It actually comes from a, comp a compound word. We have in the middle the Yod, which is the first letter for God's divine name. If you take the yod out, and let's just move it up here to the top, the yod, and then it leaves us with aleph sheen, it's actually ash, it's got the two little dots there, so it's pronounced ash at this point here, which means fire. Now the rabbis actually know that it's a compound name. Even if you take isha, Eve is not called Eve, she's not called Chava, she's called isha. Okay, her name is spelled aleph sheen hey. Again, the word fire, the second letter to God's divine name. So if we put that there, we have Yah. What did God do? They were filled with the fire of God. What happened on the day of Pentecost? When the Spirit of God come down, the Bible clearly says in, in, in the uh, Christian Bible, I say Christian Bible a lot, forgive me, I know it's New Testament because I deal with so many of my own peers I say Christian Bible because they don't like the idea of New Testament because they haven't got to that point yet. Give them time. They'll, say, they'll love to say it soon enough. But the thing is, is on the day of Pentecost, we see that the Bible says there was a rushing wind and the fire came down and there were cloven tongues like fire that rested on each one of them. I seen a painting one time and it showed it looked like a Literally, it looked like a tongue, like a lick of fire that was over each one in the room, and that was the way the artist depicted it. And it made sense to me because if Adam and Eve, you know, Adam gets his name from the ground, Adama. So we call him Adam, Adama. Eve later is called Chava only after the fall. Not before the fall, but after the fall, she's called Chava, the mother of life. That's the way we translate it. Literally, it doesn't say mother, but it's, she brings forth the life. But in this case here, as the rabbis would say, if you take God out of the equation, the yod and the hay, you have a consuming fire, and then we're in for a disaster. Now the thing is, is why do we need redemption? What's the purpose for redemption? These are things for Jews we try to figure out 
especially if you don't know that Yeshua is involved in this. The biggest thing that was going on when Yeshua was on the face of the earth was how to get back to the tree of life. In Hebrew, we call it Eitz Chaim, the tree of life. Now, let me read to you something here. It's interesting. In Genesis chapter 2, in verse 7, this is where God is actually going to create the man. Now, we already read just before this, it says that God created them, male and female, created he them. So, you'll find out in a few minutes, I don't believe in an inf inferiority at all. God made you equal in the very beginning. You'll get your Hebrew lesson on that. I'll leave it to the, uh, the other scholars to do the Greek part, but I'll give you your Hebrew lesson for this one. It says here, I'm going to read it in English first. And breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. Actually, it says, The Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living soul. All right? In Hebrew, we say, Adonai Elohim et Adam afar min ha'adama ipach. Ve'ipach means, and he breathed. Be'epav. In the nostrils, nishmar chayim. God breathes into this clay figure the breath of his own life. Chayim, by the way, comes from God's own life. It's a compound word. It's from God's divine name. We say Hashem. I know some people go ahead and use the other names, and it's okay. It doesn't bother me. But for Jewish people, we're a little funny on that. Um, but anyway, what does he do? He breathes in God's own life into the, this one body called Adam, but he does it in a plural form. And when he actually, after he does it, he actually says here uh, that he becomes a living soul. And it, and it says right here in Hebrew, Adam That's a singular. But when he breathes in there, it's pluralized. Why? Because Eve is inside of this man, inside of this body that's created there. That's why God has to breathe more than one life in there. When he takes Eve, from Adam, you never see anywhere in the Torah where he ever has to breathe in her nostrils the breath of life. She's already got it. Now you know why John the Baptist came from his mother's womb filled with the Holy Ghost. He's a type of the bride of Christ. There's no need to breathe a breath of life into him. He was to come forth from his mother's womb as Eve came forth from the womb of Adam, so to speak, you know, typing that out, he, she came forth filled with the Holy Ghost as well. There's no difference. Now, the only reason I'm establishing these things for you is because in order to go into redemption, I want you to understand how God had made us and then what happens. There was a fall that came. Now, as we go further into Genesis, we know that... Uh, you know, one second here. Yeah, we go to Genesis 22, second chapter, still in the second, second chapter, verse 22. And I'm using the Jewish Bible, so it may be a little different than what you guys see in the King James. And I'm, uh, so just bear with me on that. Uh, verse 21, And the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon the man, and he slept. Now before he actually does this, this is what I find very interesting. In all of the Bible, whether it's Joseph, whether it's David, whether it's Abraham, every story in the Bible, I see Yeshua, I see Jesus in every single story. And you're going to find a lot of those tonight. He's everywhere. He's in Boaz. He's everywhere. And it's amazing when you start seeing the types in there. When David crosses the Kidron Valley, goes up on the Mount of Olives, and weeps over Jerusalem... What did Yeshua do? He was on the Mount of Olives and he wept and he said, Oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, how often I would have hovered you as a hen with her own brood, but you would not. He said, Your house is left desolate until you say, Ba'uch haba b'sham Adonai. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Now, some people think that he's talking about the temple. And, and that is a type. We did have our temple destroyed in 70 AD by the Romans. That's also why you see the Romans getting control in Israel today. God is going to repeat history. We wanted to be delivered. Dr. Lipkin, Sister Leora back here, our fathers were there. 
And we wanted, our forefathers wanted to be delivered from the Romans. He's not going to leave that prophecy unfulfilled. So Rome is getting a stronghold in our country right now. This is why you've seen that the police in Israel, actually the special forces in Israel, just recently threw all of the Orthodox Jews, men and women, out of King David's tomb. And they did a mass, the Catholic Church did a mass inside the tomb of David, which according to our uh, Jewish law, we're not really supposed to ever go back in there again because it's defiled at that point. Now there's a scripture in Obadiah where it says that they would drink wine on Mount Zion. You want to know where you're at? Read Obadiah. That's where we're at. So anyway, God says, though, about the man, he says, it's not good for him to be alone. Now, this is the only time in Genesis, everything till now has been good. And then God comes to about Adam, and he says, it's not good for the man to be alone. So if all the other ones, like David and Joseph, all of these different men of God typed Yeshua, why not Adam? Why not Adam? I don't believe when God said that it's not good for man to dwell alone, I don't believe that it was just like, you know, Adam's like, you know, oh gosh, God, you know, I mean, everybody's got a girlfriend but me. <laughs> you know? I believe that inside of him, something he longed for, because you have to remember she's there. She is in his bosom. In fact, it doesn't say, I know, now this is a big debate amongst scholars, uh, Hebraic scholars especially. I don't know, if, I don't think the Christian scholars debate this much. In the Chabad organization, we believe that it was not actually a rib because when we look at the word translated there, it does, for, in our opinion, it's not the word rib. The Chabad Jews believe that when God take, taken the side from Adam, he taken made, made Eve from that flesh there, from, we'll say in this case, the DNA. But what's very interesting, Adam talks about that she was from Adam, from man, but then there's a very interesting little phrase in there that, that, that he uses there, and he says that God taking her from min ish. So it's interesting because he covers both aspects here. It covers the fact that, yes, she was taken from the DNA or the flesh of Hadom, and God made this into a woman, a Isha, a, another human being. But when he also includes me, Min Ish, he is saying that God has taken Eve from the fire of Hashem and made her. In other words, she's filled with the Holy Spirit. He covers both. So she's both flesh of his flesh, bone of his bone, yes, but she's also spirit of God's spirit, filled with the spirit of God, just like Adam is. Now, this is the part that's really hard for people, the next part. For women, it's not. Men, it's a little tougher. When we were in North Carolina, we'd been, we did three conferences here just recently, but I spoke to a bunch of brothers there, and they were, they were messianic brothers, and... I touched on this subject, so they talked to me privately afterwards, and they were very shocked, but they were able to understand that God never made us one inferior and the other superior. And when we sat down privately and talked in depth about this, they were like, I've never heard it like this. I said, you'd be surprised how many, mis not misinterpretations, mistranslations you have in the Bible. Not just Hebrew, in the Greek as well. We won't go deep into that anyway, though. I, just, I want to touch on this mainly because it deals with the fall. If we go to Genesis, um, this is in chapter 3, I believe it is. The fall takes place. We know the serpent uh, beguiles Eve. He deceives her, in other words. She takes of the fruit. Adam, her husband, also does. The fall comes in. And then God begins to deal with the situation. But this is the one point that I want to bring out. It says in verse 16, Unto the woman he said, I will greatly multiply the pain of thy childbearing. In sorrow thou shalt bring forth children. And yet thy desire shall be to thy husband, and he shall rule over thee. That's interesting. I wish you all could read Hebrew tonight. First off, he's prophesying to her. He says, Teladim benim, 
is what he says to start with. That means you shall birth sons. When he talks about the childbearing, he doesn't say in Hebrew that you're going to have children and it's going to hurt a lot. He says to her, Teladim Benim, Ve'elishach Tashutecha Vechu. Let me back up and read a little bit further on that though. El Haisha Omer, Hadabea Arava, Itz Note, excuse me, Itz Vonetecha. The words that he's used here is for the pain and sorrow is where God is prophesying to Eve that she's going to have sons. And the words there are pain and sorrow, but it's pain in the heart, not physical pain of the body. Wait a minute, sorry. Teshuktecha means that she will turn she will turn to her husband. Not that her desire shall be to him, but she will turn to him. Why does she turn to him? It's obvious. She had a one-on-one -on -one relationship with God, just like Adam had a one-on-one -on -one relationship with God. But now there's a fall comes. And God literally prophesies to her, you're going to have sons. It's going to cause you pain, and it's going to cause you sorrow. Because why? Why? He knew one was going to raise up and kill the other one. That's why. When he says your husband will rule over you, that's exactly what it says in Hebrew. But not by divine decree. As the brother that pointed out earlier that spoke to begin with, he says that by one man, sin came into the world, and that was Adam. He didn't say by one woman. But a lot of times, even though we know the scripture, we're quick, quickly to blame the women. Now see... Eve did make a mistake. She reasoned with the word of God. That's what got her in trouble. She was trying to figure it out. And that's what got the ball rolling. Now some people say that Adam was like Christ. He wanted to, he didn't want to see his wife go down, so he takes that sin upon himself. Well, that could be true. In one way, I see this interesting as well because Yeshua, he comes on the earth to take upon himself the sins of his own bride. But when it comes time to actually go to the cross, what does he do? He cries out in prayer and says, Father, let this cup pass from me. See, that was the physical part of the man. It was hard for him to deal with the physical anguish and agony and torture of death that he was about to go through. So perhaps Adam was trying to take on that part of the sin. But the interesting thing is, though, like Christ as well, after the fall comes, the first thing he does was blame his wife. The woman you give me, she did it. <laughs> Pass the buck. But while the Spirit of God was still upon him, no doubt, maybe it was like Christ. So I found that interesting anyway. So anyway, so the whole point is, though, we have a fall. And the thing is, is we're, we're falling equally, and now there has to be a redemption. Some, God has to do something to correct the mistake, to get this back the way it was. Now, this is why it's important to understand the fall, because before we can understand redemption, we've got to understand what happened. This is why Jews have to understand why God called us Ish and Isha. Because we did have the Spirit of God. And if they know that God is supposed to be in there, in fact, Rabbi Orly, he does a beautiful presentation about the temple. And he said, the temple is laid out like the human body. And the, holiest, the holy of holies, the chodesh v'chodeshim, is where the human heart is. And here he is, an orthodox rabbi, and he says, that is where the ruach, the spirit, of Almighty God should dwell in our hearts. And he says we should prepare our hearts for the Spirit of God to dwell there. You don't think they're not getting close? They're getting close. They're starting to understand. But the only thing is, is they don't know how to do that. When Yeshua come, we know that must have been the question, how do we get back to the Eitz Chaim? How do we get back to the Tree of Life? Well, how do we know this? Because Yeshua made a very interesting statement. He says, I am the way. I am the truth. And then he said something very interesting. He says, I am the life. In Hebrew, he said, Ani Chaim. 
Now see, for Jews, we get that. That makes sense. It makes sense because, but see, for them it was confusing. Why? It had to be confusing. See, we're a priestly nation. In Leviticus, I believe it's in chapter 19, if I'm not mistaken. In Leviticus, God says that you are a chosen people. You're a priestly nation to offer what sacrifices unto God. When people say, I had somebody come to me one time, they said, Steve, you know, you Jews, you think you're chosen people. You know, you just think you're special. I said, we're not any better than you are. I said, we're not better than the Gentiles. I said, you know, by the way, I said, Abraham and Sarah, one was a Hittite, the other was an Amorite. I said, God put Abraham through a test. What was that test that he put him through? This is something to think about. He said, take your only son. First, he prophesies that he's going to have a son. Now, you have to really think about the story because it gets interesting. He tells Abraham, you're going to have a son by Sarah. Now, God's kind of, it's interesting the way God works things because when you think about it, he tells Abraham, you're going to have a son. It's going to be by Sarah. And, and that's where I'm promising you a seed and your seed will be like the stars of heaven. Remember, in Genesis, Eve tried to reason with the word of God. How could this be? And that's what got things in trouble. God is trying to redeem man back from a fallen state. Now, he knows that Sarah and Abraham are not going to believe like it will happen later. But it's interesting how he still puts them through the same test. And so when God tells them this, Abraham first laughs, and then later when... We have three messengers or three angels that come down in, in the, uh, the cool of the evening. And when Abraham sees them, they're not guys with wings on or nothing like that. They look like regular men. They come walking up there. And Moses identifies one of those with yod heh vav -Heh, which is God's divine name. And that's the one that says when Sarah laughs within herself, why did Sarah laugh? Saying, how can these things be? Now you wonder why the woman at the well knew who Yeshua was when he came there. Because he had the same gift that was presented to Abraham. But here's what's interesting, though. She says, I didn't laugh. But it doesn't end there. What does, what does, what does Sarah do later? She's looking at the circumstances. She begins to reason with the word of God. And because she reasons with the word of God, she hands Abraham Hagar. Here, take her. She'll, she'll, that's, the, uh, that's how God's going to do it. God's already said how he was going to do it. And God knew that she would do that. And in fact, though, what I find interesting, just like with Adam, the Bible says by one man sin came into the world. When Abraham and Sarah, because a lot of times you'll hear ministers say, and Sarah laughed. Can you believe it? Well, you know what? The, God told him to name the child Yitzhak. He laughed. He didn't tell him to name, him, name the child she laughs. But he laughed because God held him responsible because he was the first one that laughed. And God knows I love Abraham. I'm related to him. So, but I'm trying to get you to understand this plan of redemption. But there is a test that he does pass. And that was when he told him to take your only son. Finally, the son does come. They get the promised son. And he says, take your only son, and I want you to go to a mountain. I'm going to show you, and I want you to sacrifice him to me. This is where Leviticus comes in, Leviticus 19, when he speaks about we are a priestly nation. God was testing Abraham to see if his descendants had it in them to be able to offer up the greatest son that would ever come on the face of the earth. Notice Abraham does this blindedly. He has no idea, no reason why God asked him to do this. He just is willing to do it. That's what God was looking for. He was looking for a people that had enough faith that could do it, even if they couldn't see why they did it. And that's what Abraham did. And that's when we become a priestly nation. Now the sad thing is, is when Yeshua comes, there are a remnant of Jews that believe that He is the Messiah, and the rest were blinded. You read where in uh, Romans 11 where Paul talks about, and this is a question I get asked a lot, you know, where it says all Israel shall be saved. And people ask me, Steve, do you mean all the Jews that are living in Israel now they're going to be saved when their eyes come open and everything? I said, no, sir, that's not what he's talking about. 
Uh, so notice what he says, a remnant even unto this day. Uh, so, so there's a remnant of Jews in Israel as well that will believe when Mashiach comes. But it doesn't mean all of us are going to believe. He says, what do you mean then by all Israel shall be saved? I said, the remnant from every age. The remnant from every age is what he's talking about. Now, how many in here support Israel that you believe they're God's people by show of hands? Do you really believe for the last 2,000 years if they did not accept Yeshua, Jesus Christ, as being their Messiah, do you believe they're going to hell? That is a very popular doctrine. I'm going to share something with you. You remember when Yeshua says, are the people they were crying out, let his blood be upon us and upon our children? They meant it for evil. That's my father's. We meant it for evil. But had God not applied that blood, then that would be true. Remember the story of Joseph? Here's where you start seeing the types and the shadows come in here. When Joseph comes along, what happens in the story of Joseph? His brethren take and throw him in the ditch. They, want, they actually want to kill him. If it wasn't for Reuben, they would have killed him. But they throw him in the ditch. They sell him out for 20 pieces of silver. The Ishmaelites come along. They take him out of the ditch. And they take him and they sell him down into Egypt. Now, when they do this, though, a very interesting thing happens. His brothers, in order to cover their sins, they take a goat and they sacrifice it and they pour it all over his coat. His coat of long sleeves, by the way, not many colors. I say that because... You try that with Jewish people that know Hebrew and they'll quickly get you. <laughs> so anyway, they pour it on his coat and they take it back to his father. This is where I believe the law that God gave Moses about the scapegoat for Yom Kippur, where we have a scapegoat and a sacrificial goat. I believe this is where that's taken from. Because Joseph is a type of the Messiah. He is the Lamb of God that is, in this case here, is a type, bears the sins of his brethren. They place their hands upon him. They forced him into this pit. And his, their sins were carried far away from their father. While they took and they killed this little lamb and poured his blood on the coat and take it back to their father and said, discern, is this your son's coat or no? And of course, one of the story, he weeps and he mourns for the loss of his son. That's the same thing that happened 2,000 years ago in Israel. You see, we were... Our forefathers, were, were, we looked at him and we could not see that he was a Messiah. This is why we are a priestly nation. This is why Israel had to be blinded so that we would offer up the sacrifice. Had we not offered him up, there would be no salvation. There would be no way for the Spirit of God to come back upon you. You see, inside of him, he said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. The Eitz Chaim. He is that life. And like Adam, he was carrying inside of his bosom, he was carrying the life that was for you. The Holy Spirit that you had need of, the life of God was inside of this man called Yeshua. That's why after his resurrection, he takes and he breathes on his apostles and he says, receive ye the Holy Ghost. You see what he was doing? He was showing you what happened in the Garden of Eden. It was, it, for them, they, I'm sure they got it. That's what happened with Adam when he was just a clay figure. God, ipach, he breathed the ipav in his nostrils, nishmar chayim, that breath of life. And so Yeshua says, receive you the Holy Spirit and breathes upon them. Why? Because in him is that life. Now like Adam, God takes him and puts him into a deep sleep as well. Remember Adam, something was wrong. His bride was in his side. Inside of him was, was Eve. And he was no doubt in travail to have her come out 
so he could have fellowship with her. Yeshua was no different. He's sitting there walking around with a bunch of Jews, and as he walks around with all these Jews, these apostles that he has, and all the others that are believing him, and the sisters, Mary and Mary Magdalene, and all these, he longed to have a fellowship with them, but in the state they were in, there was no way possible for him to have fellowship with them or with you. Unless God did with him the same as he did with Adam. He would have to be put into a deep sleep. Death in this case here. He would have to die. Because if God guarded the way of the tree of life, when Adam and Eve sinned, he blocked that way to the tree of life. Now there was no way to get back to the tree of life. So living eternally was not going to happen. That just was out of the question. Unless there was redemption. And that's what Yeshua come to do. He come to redeem his bride. He come to do the same thing. As they, the Bible says, he was a second Adam. So therefore, he had to do like Adam. He had to give his life. He had to die. And when that Roman soldier pierced his side, remember the little woman at the well when he has a little debate with her, the Samaritan woman, and he says, bring me a drink. And she says, sir, the well's deep. And they get into an ecclesiastical argument about, you know, what's supposed to be going on. And finally he says to her, if you knew who I was talking to, you'd ask me for a drink of water. I would give you water. You don't come here anymore. Now see, that began to get her attention. Of course, he tells her all the mysteries of her life as well. That's how she knows what happened with Abraham. You see, for Jewish people, it should make sense to us that Yeshua was indeed the Mashiach, that he is the Messiah, that he is the rock that Moses smote in the wilderness. Because you have to remember, God told Moses to smite the rock on the first part of the journey. Most Christians only know the 38 years later where he says, speak to the rock. But two weeks after they got, they'd gone through the parting of the Red Sea, you'd think that'd make them believers, but it doesn't. Because you see, if you don't have the Spirit of God in you. If you don't have the Holy Spirit, how are you going to believe just because you see a miracle? I mean, I think you guys would believe if you saw the parting of the Red Sea, it would sell you for the rest of your lives. But it's because you have life in you. You're able to do that now. But see, they didn't have that life. So two weeks later, yeah, yeah, okay, yeah, we saw the water walled up. No big deal, you know. I mean, gosh, who cares? You know, but the thing was, was they saw that. They came through it. And two weeks later, they're all whining and crying because they're thirsting to death. You know, and God allowed that to happen. Why? Because God knew that what they had need of was the Spirit of Almighty God. He had to make them thirst so that they would know what they have need of. And for them, it was only a type and shadow. So he tells Moses, take the elders of Israel with you and go out and smite the rock that it bring forth its water. And the whole argument was whether or not God was among them or not. That was the argument. The same argument that was happening when Yeshua was there 2,000 years ago in Israel. Who is this guy? Who is this man? He makes himself God. So the Bible repeated history. What God showed with Moses and the elders of Israel, they took the elders of Israel and they went out and they smote Yeshua. Now if you read Zechariah, I believe it's chapter 12, it talks about we will look upon him whom we have pierced. A lot of times, most people think of the hands and the feet being pierced. In Hebrew, it says thrust through. And it could still apply to the hands and the feet. But when I'm dealing with rabbis and they try to use that little roundabout way, it doesn't say hands and feet are pierced. It says he would be thrust through. So that's right. He would be thrust through. Because when his side was thrust through with that Roman soldier's spear into his side, the Bible says blood and water came out and the water was separated from the blood. Why? It was an open sign to Israel that their rock had been smitten and that the waters of life was coming forth. And if they did not drink, they would not live. And the Jews that were there 3,500 years ago in the wilderness journey, I don't care how much they bittered and complained, if they didn't drink that water, they would have perished in that desert. They had to either drink or die. And here the rock was in their midst. And he was smitten. And the water came forth from his side. Now, we'll close here in just a moment here. Um, Let's go back to John chapter 1. 
Now this scripture might make more sense to you. Verse 29. The next day John seeth Jesus coming unto him and saith, Behold, the Lamb of God, which take away the sins of the world. It is believed that this happened on the first of Elul, which is 40 days before Yom Kippur. This is a time when they have to select a scapegoat for Israel because the high priest is going to take and confess. He's first going to offer a bullock for himself and for his family. Then there's, they bring up two goats. One is a scapegoat, and that's where the priest confessed the sins of Israel. It's interesting, too. They confess the sins of Israel. He doesn't say confess the sins of the house of Judah or the sins of the house of Israel as we were divided as two different nations, but the sins of the house of Israel. Now that's very interesting if you think about it, because why? Had, they, had it not been commanded that way, when the house of Israel went into captivity at 723 BCE, before, the, before, before Yeshua came, when they went into captivity, that atonement over that lamb that was confessed, included them, even though they weren't there. That was from the commandment of God. God made sure there was something to cover the lost house of Israel. And then when Yeshua came, He took the place of both houses. And so when we said, let His blood be upon us and upon our children, we meant it for evil, just like Joseph's brothers did. But are we missing any tribes? In fact, when Joseph goes to reveal himself to his brethren, they're all there again. And they begin to recognize what they have done. They begin to discuss, we did, what did we do? We did we hurt him when he was pleading and crying and we wouldn't do anything about it? That's what's about to happen in Israel now. <coughs> what's interesting though, do you know where Joseph's wife was? She wasn't there. But the Bible clearly says that all the way over in the house of Pharaoh, they heard the weeping in the morning for what they had done to Joseph. We're going to go into Esther tomorrow. And then you will know why you were called to be the bride. There is a great responsibility for being the bride. It's not just going to a party. Keep one thing in mind as we dismiss tonight. When Esther, it was a Jew that brought it to her attention, Mordecai. She represents the bride of Mashiach, the bride of Christ. But Mordecai comes to her and tells her, at the time of the destruction of Israel, we also do a news broadcast called Israeli News Live, and you don't have to watch that. You can see for yourself what's going on around the world against Israel, the anti-Semitism in every nation. It's even in this nation. Down in South Florida, we had a rabbi over there that was just murdered on the way to the synagogue. It's coming here too, majorly. I could take off a kippah, tuck in the tzitzit, you'd never know I'm Jewish. Dr. Lipkin, he better run. <laughs> I have to pick on him a little bit. But in all sincerity, though, Mordecai comes to Esther and he tells her, think not that you will be spared just because you're the queen. Her job was to plead for Israel. You have one opportunity to do that because there's coming a time where their eyes will be open but you're the one that makes the difference. And we know God will come down there and stomp out Armageddon and any other battle that Israel faces, but He's expecting you to make that stand. He's expecting you to be praying for Israel. God bless you.